Yeah, good afternoon. Um, my name's Chris Morley, uh, Biosecurity Manager at Dairy NZ. Um, over the next hour, I'll try and answer as many of the questions as I can about uh, biosecurity and mycoplasma vivis. Please uh, keep sending the questions in. We've got them coming in now. We've got some that are already uh, with us, so please send those through, and I'll do my very best to answer those over the next hour and hopefully uh, get some more information out there. Um, and many of you will have been to pharma meetings over the past uh, three or four months, and there are more meetings happening across the country as part of the uh, bulk milk uh, national program. So uh, you'll, you'll be getting more information from and able to ask questions at those meetings. Um, I'll talk about the key principles of biosecurity today and then before we get into those uh, questions and many of you or all of you will be getting within your inside dairy uh, uh, mail out a uh, fact sheet and a letter from Tim but essentially talking about mycoplasma bovis uh, and talking about the key principles of, of uh, biosecurity and it also includes what you may already have heard of something called the biosecurity warrant of fitness which is a, is a tool to help you assess your own farm biosecurity. Uh, and it's tailored to be used ideally with your vet uh, who knows your farm and, and knows your operation really well, hopefully. Uh, and we've developed this tool with vets and with farmers, particularly farmers from uh, around the uh, Waimati, Waitaki area that, that have been dealing with Embovis. So it's, it's come from the grassroots, which is really cool. So the, the key parts of, of biosecurity, uh, and this won't be rocket science to most people, the, the, the biggest risk really is, is animal movements. And when I say that, uh, we, when we talk about Embovis, uh, we know that Embovis, small bacteria, it moves in animals. And the problem is that most animals with Embovis show no clinical signs, uh, that we call them silent spreaders. And because we've seen animals can move before we know a farm has got an infection, and um, because we tests take time to do and to be confident that the test is negative. Animals have moved before MPI has, has been able to quarantine those farms. So animals moving, there's always a risk risk there. Uh, but this is the same for many other diseases that we, we, we live with in New Zealand, whether it's BVD, Yonis disease, it's the actual animal moving is, is the greatest risk. So the challenge there is to think about when we're moving animals, do we, do we need to move them if we're moving them to grazing? Do we, do we need to co-mingle them? Do we need to mix them with other people's animals? Is there a way to keep them separate um, and, and, keep, and keeping things quite tight in that way? Um, when we talk about uh, co-mingling moving, we talk about separation and that brings us to the next area, which is our farm boundary. Um, having, a, having a good separation, recommending two meters between your farm and the next, so animals can't have nose to nose contact is, is a really good way to manage the risk for biosecurity diseases, uh, animal diseases, but particularly M. bovis. Uh, many cases, uh, there, are, there are physical barriers, roads, tracks, uh, hedges, but if there isn't, if it's just a hot wire, we've been recommending, and, and, and I think everyone's been recommending, to put in a secondary, a second fence, uh, at the very least a temporary hot wire, but ideally something more permanent, to avoid those animals uh, getting nose to nose. And obviously they can reach under if it's a hot wire, so you're not wasting too much dry matter, but you're avoiding that nose to nose interaction, which is really important. Um, Another key key area of biosecurity is, is managing people visiting your farms and, and also contractors and equipment coming onto farms. So whenever we somebody comes onto the farm and is going into areas where the animals are kept, uh, thinking, are they clean? Are they uh, is it, are their boots clean? Are they, is it, if they're going to handle the animals, if we're talking AB techs or vets, are they turning up clean? And I think pretty much everyone's getting that right and is getting that really right at the moment. Uh, but contractors going into paddocks, you know, is the equipment reasonably clean. It's, and obviously, we're not talking surgical clean here. We're not talking cleaning a forage harvester, uh, for example. It takes four hours to really clean one of those right down, and no one can afford to take a forage harvester out of action for four hours uh, when, when in the busy time. So, But is it clean? Is it, is it wheels reasonably tidy? Because if it's not, there's risk. Uh, I'm, here, I'm talking more about uh, invasive weeds, velvet leaf. There's risks of weed seeds coming on, dropping off into paddocks, and the same with, with utes. Uh, Embovis wouldn't spread very easily that way. It's a very um, fragile bacteria, which means it's killed by UV light. It's killed very easy. So, um, so it's not a not a high risk for for Embovis. But think of other diseases. Um, 
in terms of uh, the farm structure, you know, having one entrance is, is a really good idea. So people know if they come into the farm, they come through the main entrance. There's an area for cleaning. If we're talking people, a foot bath, uh, an area, a hose, a brush at the very least, and ideally disinfectant, and also vehicles coming on, coming through one entrance. So we're recommending people, if you've got multiple entrances to your farm, uh, uh, padlock them, bolt them up, and just avoid people coming in through different ways. And that's really important. And again, with, with always a risk of stock escaping from neighbours you know is there a way for animals to wander onto your farm and again that's a risk and we've we've, we've seen that with biosecurity outbreaks where animals have inadvertently ended up on your farm that aren't yours and that's really really not what you want to see uh, with something like Mbovis. Um, just general biosecurity awareness uh, and thinking about what are we bringing onto the farm uh, and are there any risks so the biosecurity warrant of fitness gives gives you a chance it takes about an hour to work through that with your vet uh, and it's time well spent and I think most vet clinics are well aware of, of that and actually NZVA the vet association helped develop that as well um, I'll talk a bit about some of the questions but just before I do we've, we've been asked and to give a bit of an overview by some of what Dairy NZ has been doing uh, during the response uh, since going back to sort of 22nd of July and um, we've, we've been doing a whole bunch of different things to support farmers uh, at the at my, my own level uh, we've been working daily with MPI uh, on a range of technical issues working through policy uh, positions and actually to be quite blunt ensuring that they they uh, get really involved with this response at the start and making them understand just how significant this is we've done a lot of work around the economics of like what this could potentially cost uh, New Zealand dairy farming and beef uh, and that was really important up front we've had people working on the ground uh, we've got staff actually out there we've got an RP manager out of Ashburton working uh, with with farmers we've had the liaison managers working out of Omaru uh, and, and we're the, currently we've got about five of our staff in the field helping farmers and working with them alongside MPI obviously our communications team and our technical team have been providing a lot of resources uh, which are on our website uh, and have been mailed out emailed out just more information and we try and do that collectively with the other industry organizations so that we're all on the same page we're all giving the same information out there we're fed farmers beef and lamb meat industry uh, MPI that association and it's really important that we are aligned because there's nothing worse in, in any kind of response by security response where different groups are giving out different information and we've I think we've managed to do that reasonably well um, we've been very involved in the industry uh, MPI technical working group which is essentially working for all of the ongoing technical issues uh, as they've come along uh, that's been quite quite a bit of work uh, and we've also had our leadership team very very involved with this and the board increasingly so there's a, there's a lot of activity much of it behind the scenes uh, and some of it more more common um, I'll move into some of the questions. I see there's more coming through now, so, so please keep sending those through. Um, the first question, and probably a good question to start with, is how did it get here? Um, and a lot of people ask that, you know, what, what's changed? Why, why have we found Mbovis in New Zealand? And to give context, uh, New Zealand, uh, until the detection, was one of only two countries that doesn't have Mbovis. So Norway is three uh, at the moment, uh, and New Zealand was three, uh, and now we've got it. So that when you look at the, how it could have got here, and MPI spent uh, and invested a lot of time and effort Effort with experts to look at this more closely there we look at what we call pathways or, or ways uh, that the bacteria and it's a very small bacteria could could have come in and and some of the key ones are uh, we, we look at animal remedies so drugs and, and vaccines particularly used to treat cattle there's a, there's a potential risk there a very low risk but a potential risk uh, we've looked at they've looked well, MPI have looked at the risk of animal imports coming in so a very small number of, of cattle uh, historically have come in from Australia with a whole bunch of checks and balances in place and 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 what's been quite good is firstly no no cattle have come in from uh, Australia for the last three years and there's a precaution MPI have actually put a, a ban on cattle coming in at the moment because of the response but more importantly some of the testing work looking at the DNA, DNA typing the genotyping uh, for Mbovis it suggests that it hasn't come from Australia we've looked at the Australian types of Mbovis and there's there's not a good correlation between the one we've got and the one in Australia so animals coming in uh, seem to be very low low risk 
there's a risk of uh, other animals. So uh, sheep come into New Zealand, uh, again, under import, imported sheep. But again, considered to be very low risk because embovis is a disease of cattle primarily. Uh, it's very specifically attached to cattle uh, and, and adapted. So again, other animals, very low risk. A uh, lot of lot of interest in semen. Uh, we, we import a lot of semen into New Zealand and that allows us to improve our genetic uh, potential of our herd. And, and over the last 30 years, there's a lot of semen come in. The questions with semen is, there's, there's never been an officially documented case of uh, embovis spreading through semen and, and, and going into a new country. So it's never happened knowingly before. Uh, we've been bringing semen into New Zealand for many, many years, and we haven't um, uh, found embovis before. So if it's happened, it would be a very, very, very unlikely lotto event is the way I'd best describe it. But it, it's fair to say the, the risk is not zero. Uh, so you, you can, have, can very rarely have zero risk in this world in any way. So, so again, like with historically animals coming in, veterinary medicines coming in, there's risk, uh, semen. Uh, we've also talked about uh, and looked very closely at equipment coming in. Uh, so that could be equipment that's used near animals, milking equipment that was brought in uh, that perhaps wasn't clean, that, that there could be potential risk there. But again, there's no evidence that I'm aware of uh, of that happening. So uh, so lots of possible ways it could have come in. And, and there's actually a report which MPI have commissioned, and I think will be made publicly available very soon, that talks about all of these risk pathways. But at the moment, there isn't a smoking gun. Uh, and it would be nice if we did have one because that would be really useful to know how it had come in. Uh, but there's just a whole bunch of, of, of maybes and they're all very low likelihood events. Uh, the second question we're getting at the moment increasingly is what about winter grazing uh, in terms of animals needing to go off, off farm to, to graze either at dry off uh, or with the current feed shortages in much of the country uh, just for feed. Um, the, the challenge, animals going off for grazing is in itself is not a risk. Uh, the, the two risks though that are assigned with it is if they co-mingle or mix with animals from other farms then that, that is a risk because we don't know the status of all farms in New Zealand at the moment. So if your animals are mixing with, and it's a bit like kids going to kindergarten or, or primary school school, uh, they, they look healthy when they leave your place and leave home, but they're mixing in with a whole bunch of different animals. And when they come back, and I, I know as a parent myself, you know, the, the kids about week three, week four of uh, winter term, they all start getting the, 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 the gummy snotty noses. And then a week later, mum and dad have got it because it's this big mixing pot. So if we've got animals going to grazing, if we can avoid them having contact, direct contact with other animals, that's really important. The other key message though for grazing is, is Nate. And I think we've, we've heard this uh, incredibly uh, lots over the last uh, three or four months uh, from many, many quarters in the media is it's really important to get those NAIT records sorted because if you are unfortunate to be a farm that becomes connected to the embovis response, it makes MPI's job much easier if they can quickly trace animal movements through the NAIT system. And we've found where, where people have actually put the right information into NAIT, it works. And where people don't put the data in, it doesn't work. And then there's a lot of extra uh, to and froing and interviews with farmers and a lot, lot slower. So, so Nate, really important for grazing. B is find ways to avoid animals mixing together. The next question that naturally comes on from this is how do you know if, if a farm uh, that your animals are going to mix with is, is free of embovis or not? And that's a really challenging question. And it, it also answers another question that's just come in from share milk as we're going to a, a new farm at the end of May. How do we know that farm's not got embovis? And the, the short answer is there's no 100% way anywhere in the world to know that. And that's because uh, unless you've got clinical disease and, and it's been proven on the farm, and then in this case, MPI will have quarantined the farm, uh, and then we know we've got it, but that's easy. Once you've got it, it's positive, yeah, 100%. But when, when, when they've not found disease, because it's not always expressing as clinical disease, because we're not always seeing animals sick, uh, and because the test isn't a really great test, the, the bulk milk test is probably the best thing we've got because it can test for any anti any evidence of uh, embovis in the milk. You're doing a sample from a large number of animals if we're talking the bulk milk test. Uh, and also the uh, the mastitis cow, the red milk test, uh, which has been rolled out nationally. So those, those two tests are our best chance at the moment of having confidence that a farm is free. But of course, if there isn't any uh, milk going into the vat, or if there's animals that aren't lactating, aren't being, being milked, uh, the, that, that test isn't going to check those animals. Um, there isn't a reliable 
herd tests that could be commercially rolled out across the country at the moment. Uh, we, w there are antibody tests being developed commercially and, and some of the commercial labs uh, I think are quite close on those. But there, there are challenges um, with the antibody test, which is looking for essentially the, the immune system of an animal. If it comes across Embovis, we'll, we'll produce over time antibodies and we can test for those antibodies. The challenge is that there are different types of mycoplasma. Uh, and there's at least two in New Zealand that we know we already have, and they cause no problem at all. They don't cause disease. They just sit there in the background. The trouble is the immune system, if it's seen this other type of mycoplasma, it develops antibodies. And those antibodies are very similar to what we would see with mycoplasma bovis. So it makes a test uh, challenging to understand the results sometimes. You get antibodies, oh, is it mycoplasma bovis? or is it one of these other mycoplasmas? And the only way to be sure is, 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 is a lot of more in-depth testing, which at the moment is, is run through MPI, uh, and essentially using something called PCR, or poly polymerase chain reaction, which is a test that looks for fragments of, of DNA from Mbovis, and that's a very sensitive test, uh, but the sampling procedure is, is not simple. So, so in, in short answers, it's, it's, it's quite hard to be really confident that we've, we've, we've not got it on the farm, uh, and that is a challenge. Uh, please do ask questions as we go. We've got some more coming in, and, and my, my colleagues here are just saying keep, keep sending those questions in. Um, the next question is, uh, do we know if eradication is possible or not? That's a really important question at the moment. We're sort of five, six months into this. There's a lot of farms now impacted. We've got uh, you know, a, a, an increasing number of farms infected. So I think we're officially up to 20-ish uh, at the moment. Um, but there's a number of farms that are under restriction uh, or notice of direction. So a lot of people are actually uh, suffering the impacts of the response. So if we can't eradicate it, that's, that's important to make that decision because we can start looking at different ways of managing this. The bottom line at the moment is it, it's still feasibly technically possible to eradicate and that's the advice that MPIs uh, received uh, pre-Christmas from a, an independent technical advisory group which is made up of, of mycoplasma and disease experts from North America, Australia, the UK that came together with experts from, from um, New Zealand that aren't involved directly with the response and aren't working for industry. So very, very uh, independent. And their review of all of the response work to date, all of the testing, the surveillance is clearly, yes, what you're doing is right, MPI, you, you, you're on the money. The testing surveillance program is, is actually excellent. Uh, despite all the challenges and delays of, of getting test results, it's, it's the right way to be going. And, and yes, eradication is still possible uh, based on the theory and, and the, what we're seeing at the moment that the farms all appear to be connected at the moment, or just about all of them, um, the or vast majority are connected to the first farms that we've seen. So it's like a great big spider web uh, of farm, and it's connected through predominantly animal movements. So while that situation stays the same, there is still an opportunity to eradicate. If, if we suddenly start seeing cases appearing, perhaps with the bought milk testing that are not connected to that network, then that changes the eradication conversation dramatically. Obviously, it's an MPI decision. Uh, it's an MPI-led response, and that's their mandate to lead these responses. And I think their intention is to uh, start looking at that decision. We've heard late February, we were hearing March. Um, I think it's probably more likely to be March if you look at the bought milk testing work that's going on uh, at the moment in terms of getting all those results in. So a little way to go yet, and that's not good news for a lot of people because if we, we want certainty we want to know where we're at the reality is is we, we've, we've got a government we've got an MPI that's actually having a crack at uh, trying to get rid of this for for dairy farmers and beef farmers and that's good that's cool because most other countries didn't try and stop it Australia when they got it they just sort of went oh well here it is we'll just roll with it and uh, they're paying the price for that now they've got ongoing cases and it's a real challenge for farms if it stays here long term so uh, that's that's the the eradication situation at the moment um, what are the financial implications for New Zealand farms and New Zealand from this disease is a question we, we've just had come through. So if we look at farms overseas, where, say, Australia, for an example, when you first get mycoplasma on the farm, 
it can be quite significant. We know, and people will know this from what you've read already, uh, mastitis can be a real issue and it's a really tricky mastitis to treat. Uh, most antibiotics don't, don't touch it. Uh, there's no vaccine. So uh, the resultant outcome is you end up culling cows and in some cases quite a lot of cows. Uh, so we've talked to farmers from Australia with maybe four or 500 cows and they've had to cull out 80 cows to actually rid it, to actually get, get control and get rid of clinical signs. Uh, we know again with calves, if calves get infected, they can get joint ill or swollen joints. And in many cases, the only outcome is, is to call those for calves. So the cost there, um, we, we know in, in intensive systems overseas, pneumonia is a problem, probably less of a problem in New Zealand because we're, we're mostly outside farming. Uh, so there are some real serious on-farm impacts from this if, if it affects your farm. Thankfully, overseas, uh, it only affects a small proportion of farms at any one time. But again, if, if you're unlucky to be one of those farms with it, there, there are some quite serious implications. The other cost of this, though, is, is um, if in terms of our share milking model, if, if farms are infected, uh, so you're a share milker and your cows have got lembovis, even if you remove the affected animals, there's a question mark over the herd status. It's likely that the herd is still positive and could have problems going into the future. That will create challenges, I would imagine, in terms of a, an owner wanting to take on the share milker. And, and vice versa in terms of if a, if a farm has embovis, uh, an owned farm with a share milker on there, the share milker moves off. Uh, someone coming on, you know, if they know there's been embovis there, that's another problem for us. It's the same with grazing. We, we know with a lot of heifer grazing, animals do mix and co-mingle. Uh, and again, that's another potential impact. So, so it, it has some potential to change our farming systems if it stays here and isn't eradicated. And that's that's um, yeah potentially quite quite serious. In terms of trying to put a dollar value on on what this would cost, it's really hard to do because there are so many variables in terms of of, of how many farms when they're infected and a whole bunch of variables. We've We've done that economic work uh, at Dairy and Z with, with some of the dairy companies and with MPI, uh, and that they're sort of some of the worst case scenarios quickly get into the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, over over a ten year period, uh, and that's based on no controls. That's just if it's allowed to just just sort of basically slowly spread like it did in Australia. So big numbers, and on some farms, quite quite significant impacts. Um, how do I manage Embovis when it gets onto the farm? So at the moment, uh, we're in the case of reporting to MPI and quarantining and, and seeing if eradications are possible. So at the moment, uh, we're not really in the living with Embovis stage. But if we were to look forward to potentially if we're not able to eradicate and we do end up having to live with Embovis, uh, as other countries do, um, it's a case of working with your vets. It's a case of uh, uh, good milk and hygiene, if we're talking mastitis, there are a number of, of, of ways to, to manage the disease, but I'm not going to go into great detail on those now. Suffice to say, uh, Embovis is, is in all of those other countries that have dairy cows. They're all still very profitable and, and successful as a country uh, in their dairying. So it's not the end of the world, but it's something we would really rather not have if at all possible. Uh, um, another question has just come through is around uh, stock trucks coming onto farms. What's the risk? And uh, particularly about bobby truck, bobby calf trucks coming onto farm. So we know the main way this spreads in both is, is through live animals, through cattle coming in, mixing nose to nose. So when, when stock trucks come on, if, if you're talking a stock truck moving adult cattle, they're usually empty, they should be clean. So the risk is, is, is very, very low. If those stock trucks are clean. I know a lot of the transporters have been doing a lot of work in that space. Uh, then the risk is it can be managed. If, you, if you've got a situation with a stock truck that's done a backload, so animals have gone across the country, across the North Island, and then you're basically on the way back, they're just putting more animals and bringing them back without cleaning. That's, that's risky because you've got mucus, saliva, and a whole load of stuff in that truck. So there's, there's greater risk there. And I think that, that practice people are aware of as a risk. And the way to manage that is to clean the truck uh, between those animals. Um, in terms of bobby calf trucks, uh, and I think most people have their bobby calf uh, collection sites away from the main herd, probably on the tanker track. Uh, so a truck coming in, picking up, going out. Again, the risk is relatively low because uh, animals aren't getting off the truck. Once the calves get on the truck, uh, they're gone. And also the facilities where bobby calves are kept typically are not near where other calves are. So there's limited uh, a chance for crossover. But what would be risky would be if the 
bobby truck uh, driver uh, and, and, and people working on those trucks were to go into calf pens where calves that weren't bobbies were. And that, that practice is pretty uncommon, I think, in New Zealand. But if it was happening, um, then there's risks there. And that's a risk for not just for embovis, but for a whole bunch of uh, calf scours and, and other calf diseases. So it's generally recognised as bad practice to do that. Uh, so, so bobby calf trucks are, are low risk, but again, just just ensuring there's good separation uh, from from the herd and the animals. Um, we'll go to the next question, um, and we've had this question many times. It's and is there a risk of this of, of the mycoplasma bovis affecting people? And the short answer is no. Uh, there there are over a hundred different types of mycoplasmas, and some of them do affect people, uh, but mycoplasma bovis is a cow disease, hence the name. Uh, if you look in the literature, there's been a couple of cases ever described with people that were already very sick with very depleted immune systems, uh, suffering from cancer and, and it really, really ill people. Uh, and there's two cases in the entire world where they've actually been able to say, we think we might have found uh, evidence of M. bovis. Uh, but again, it's just evidence of it wasn't why they were sick in the first place. But essentially, M. bovis doesn't affect people, doesn't affect humans, uh, and it's not a risk. And the Ministry of Health uh, in New Zealand has made that uh, statement and, and, and made that very public. And that's in a, a line with uh, other overseas health authorities. M Mbovis is not a disease of people. It's also not a food safety risk, and it's also not a trade risk. So I think people are very clear on that, but it's good just to, to reiterate. Um, Another question we've got is in New Zealand, unpasteurized uh, milk, waste milk fed to calves, is that, a, is that a risk? And the short answer is yeah, very much so. Um, if, uh, if milk is, is collected from, from cows when they calf, if those cows happen to be subclinically infected with embovis, so they're showing no, clin no clinical signs, uh, you've had no testing done, you can't tell if they're sick, but if they're excreting embovis in their milk and that's then going into calf milk, then there's there's risk. And we know we've seen this quite explosive outbreaks in calves uh, where that's happened. So the simple answer is, is if you're feeding your calf milk to your calves, then that's keeping the, the risk in house. And, and and if to be honest, if the cows were infected, then there's other ways the calves could be infected. So keeping the, the, the management of that milk to your own calves is how to manage that risk. If you if you're sending milk off off the platform, off the farm to other people for calf rearing, uh, for selling for others, then that milk can potentially, well, not just potentially, will spread embovis if there's embovis on the farm where those cows are and it's not been detected. Uh, there are ways to manage that. And, and obviously some people have invested in uh, uh, pasteurizers to pasteurize the milk at the farm. Uh, and that that can break that cycle. It also breaks the cycle of a number of other diseases. So uh, people that have been using pasteurizers overseas have, have, have sort of noted some improvement in, in, in spread of other diseases. So uh, particularly uh, some of the calf scours. So it's, uh, it's yeah, another another tool. But yeah, absolutely calf milk is a risk to, to spreading it off, off farm. Um, Next question I've got is if you can't see, oh no, here we go. When the bulk milk test is being done, um, do you get a disease-free certificate? So this question has been asked uh, over the recent weeks at a number of the meetings where the bulk milk testing has been uh, talked about. Uh, and all I can do is reiterate what a colleague of mine in Fonterra, Lindsay Burton, has said. Uh, obviously, he's the, the chief vet with Fonterra. Is they're looking for a way to do that, to provide uh, uh, information back to negative farms uh, once our testing is all done to provide some information to say, look, we've, we've done this testing on these dates and based on the testing uh, at that time, there's, there's no positive or it's a negative result at that point. Uh, there are caveats that need to be considered because, as I said at the start, we don't, um, if we're not testing the animals, if their milk isn't going into the vat or isn't going into the mastitis sample that's been collected, then we're, we're not able to say anything about the status of those animals, so young stock, if there are any bulls still on the farm or any dry stock. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, there's been a, an undertaking to find a way to do that. Uh, but of course, if, if you're positive from those tests, then you will obviously be getting a phone call and a follow-up from MPI very quickly, uh, because any positive tests uh, detected through that system are referred to MPI. Uh, so I guess it is no news is good news. And I know people are getting sick of hearing that, no news is good news. But the reality is um, there's a massive push to find any new cases through the bulk milk testing, the national surveillance. So if, if they do detect a positive, you will be getting a call. Uh, and that's really, really critical information. So, so no news really is good news. But I do I do hear there are the, the, foot, the steps afoot to provide negative results back as well uh, when that 
when that can be figured out. So another question, uh, when is the bulk milk testing done and what do you get? Oh, very similar question, another follow-up question is, are the bulk milk results from the screening program being communicated to vet clinics directly? Or is it if is the onus on the farmers to communicate results only if they want to? So, uh, as I say, if there's positive uh, results coming out of the national bulk milk testing, NPR will be informed immediately, and they'll be following up directly with farmers uh, if if there's a farmer infected affected by that. So that that's the mechanism to communicate the result to the farmer. Uh, in terms of uh, my understanding, is NPR doesn't report it to the vet to your vet. That's between the farmer and the vet, and that's down to privacy rules uh, so yeah same question as before I think cool any uh, more questions we've got here um, I think I've answered those so yeah just got a few more questions just coming coming through as as we go oh no we're there so uh, I think we've covered all those questions I'll just check um, Yep, no, I think we've covered off all the questions that have come forward. No no more coming through. So great. Look, look, I hope that was helpful. As I say, there will be information coming in the post, if not today, tomorrow, uh, with with the Embovis Warrant of Fitness and, and some signage to uh, to help remind people coming onto farm to to, to take biosecurity precautions. Uh, and then as, if you've not already had a bulk milk uh, testing workshop in your area, they're being rolled out over the next three or four weeks uh, right across the country. And Dairy and Z will be presenting at all of those uh workshops to provide more of this information at those so uh, please feel free to look on the website and see what we've got on there there's quite a lot of information and if you've got questions again uh, feel free to reach out to us and we'll, we'll get back to you and uh, i'll end it there thanks very much